to serve him. So take it away, John. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks for the time here. I, I, normally, I, I used to hear you start with a joke, but I'm not funny, so I don't do that anymore. Um, and I don't know why that screen's still up there. Let's see if we can get that to clear up a little bit. But what we want to talk a little, little bit about today is uh, is, is the cloud. I've uh, heard that for years. How many people are using web-based applications in the business? Everybody? How many people, is there anyone in the room who they can say their company is entirely web-based? So I have literally met with clients this year for the first time that everything is run over the web. Now, you still have PCs, but they don't have any servers on premise. Now, servers have a carbon footprint, and they cost money, right? And that's, a, uh, that's an, not only an expense for your business, but it also consumes energy, consumes energy manufacturing it, landfill, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I'm uh, with My Apps Anywhere. My Apps Anywhere is a uh, software as a service uh, brand, and Michael Hollingsworth, uh, certainly travels around St. Louis and talks to uh, folks about what My Apps Anywhere can do for your business. I'm going to talk right now about, about that. I do still get one cloud question, so I'm going to start with this. And that is, uh, what's the difference between a public and a private cloud? Uh, the difference between a public cloud and a private cloud is who owns the firewall. It's probably the easiest way to think about it. It's a private cloud. Your company owns the firewall, which is the security rules protecting the program on the site. If you're not doing that, you're in what's called a public cloud, very simply. Uh, a lot of people are doing hybrid. They recognize that internal systems can connect to the outside and connect with systems in the cloud and produce results. So out of that, uh, many people have come to realize that this is an extension of their business. And why do people do this? Um, those, everybody in the room raised their hands so they're using cloud technologies. Why did, why did your company do this? Anybody know? Want to take a shot? They're Redundancy. more active. Anybody? Redundancy. Redundancy? Okay, that's that's a a reason to do it. Use the cloud for a redundant site. Mobility. Mobility is a great one. Uh, some of the companies I mentioned are totally cloud. One I met with last week, they have 50 employees and have no office. Everybody works remotely. Everybody travels around. Uh, let's take, uh, for instance, uh, Office 365. Why are you using that? Uh, it's something Microsoft wants to do, so I think, no, that's not it. There's a better reason we'll talk about it a little bit later. There's cost savings associated with being cloud. Uh, significant cost savings in many cases, and I'll show you actually a business case for that. So any questions around that? All right. The green cloud. Well, why is the cloud green? We kind of led into that in the introduction. If you don't have to run servers on-premise, servers communicate, uh, uh, take a lot of power. And we know that because we go in the room and it gets hot. Well, power is converted into one of the byproducts is heat. Heat in the room. That heat has to be cooled out of the room. Some of you are in small businesses, used to have servers in a room, maybe still do, that it gets overheated, right? Especially on days like today. And you have to bring in extra cooling. I see heads nodding. Yes, we have that problem. Well, you can get rid of that problem by sharing the capacity on the server in the cloud. Well, why does that save money? Wait. The cloud hoster has a server. Does that save money? Yes, it does, because what's happened is something called Moore's Law. It's been going since the 50s. Moore's Law says every 18 months, the speed of a computer doubles. The amount of data you can store on a disk doubles during the same period. We've now reached a point where uh, servers cannot be consumed by a business in general. I know Amazon's in the room. Maybe they can do it, but a few of us can do that. And uh, that's just an example of what's happened. So 10 years ago, I went to go work for H&R Block in a former life, and they said, we've got a problem. We don't know whether we have enough capacity or, uh, or too much or too little. So a couple weeks later, I came back, and I said, yeah, it's about it. Two weeks later, I came back, and I said, well, the good news or bad news? They said, start with the good news. I said, the good news is you're not going to run out of capacity. OK, what's the bad news? The bad news is you're only using 3% of your compute. That was 10 years ago. And that is a major company. The very first year was a $3 million savings by moving them to virtualization. I'm sure many of you virtualized in-house. OK. That was the initial cost savings. That was the initial cut of this. But now it's reached a point where why do I own servers, especially in a small medium business? You start thinking about why am I investing money in servers? Think about 
earlier uh, the Go Green business, she has 25 employees. Should she be out buying servers and running them and paying somebody to come in and manage them? It's not always ideal. So we know that companies that adopt cloud uh, are being green. They're not buying servers that cost money to consume and they're not consuming the power. Uh, they're not having to cool them. Right now, the estimate is an annual energy savings of $12.3 billion in CO2 reductions by 200 million barrels of oil. Uh, the other thing is pure machines, and the, the machines are actually utilized much more in the cloud. Um, 60 to 70 percent utilization versus what you might be able to achieve on premise, which even if you virtualize and combine a bunch of workloads on there, you might get to 20 percent. Well, these are being driven up to 60 to 70 percent. Better utilization is both more efficiency and kilowatt hours of oil. So, we're here to solve challenges, and cloud customers can regularly record as much as 58% savings in three years. This is based on a study that we did of companies with under 200 employees. So across those, many of them were seeing a 58% savings um, over what they were spending before, and plus the lower initial cost. And you're not, uh, you're not investing your capital in that, it's an operating expense. Okay, so, What's the difference between on-premise and in the cloud? On-premise, we've already said, hardware and software licenses, you don't have to go buy those and spend capital doing it. You can actually invest uh, each month. Uh, capital expenditures and upgrades, you're, you're going to avoid having to pay for those upgrades every three years. The systems are going to scale. You don't have to worry about those things. You're not having to bring somebody on site to maintain them. You're not having to pay some guy to come around and uh, spend a few hours uh, maintaining system. Um, will work over internet, any internet connection. But I do have to ask you, do you think the hoster has a better security team or do you have a better security team? Mm -hmm. I know anywhere to the way you guys probably have lots of security people. Probably similar to what you might see in the hosting site. But many small and medium business, we know the biggest risk is security at this point. Um, if uh, uh, I have a device we could actually bring in your site, would show all the attacks occurring, and you see them straight. Boom, 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 boom. Your network's being attacked each and every day. Now, have you been compromised? You don't know. What's the impact then to you? Maybe they're nothing. Maybe there's something. If you're in a regulated company, it's important to know those things. Okay, the other thing to think about, anybody read the book Good to Great? Anybody read that? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting why those companies are no longer around, but uh, we'll ignore that part. Uh, I like going to Circuit City. I don't know about you, but I liked it. So, um, the thing is, in the middle, is, is uh, this is called the headshot principle. It's what you care deeply about. So you heard the passion for printing, right? And how many people have a passion for printing? In the world? Not as many, but we know we have people that we can count on to come in and help us. And those people can help us because they focus there and they spend their energy there. If you spend your energy in your business in placing people who are out of work, right? You're passionate about that. You make that happen. I probably wouldn't be as good at that, right? But we're passionate about hosting. What drives your business? Your business is placing people. Your business is bringing efficiency to people in the printing space. If we can do the, the things that we care most about and focus on those, it's more rewarding to us personally, as well as to our client base. But you see a lot of people, in fact, the lady uh, earlier who spoke and, and left on, was with Go Green. She commented on, oh, I have to spend so much time dealing with the IT issues. You're in the cloud, are you spend the time doing that? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. You're in a position where you can avoid those kind of things. So I'm going to now transition the discussion. That's the go green phase. We're going to talk about the future now. And this is the future for your business. If you're a small business owner in the room, or even if you're a large business, is IT a cost center or a strategic asset? I don't know. Anybody want to take a cut at that for you? What do you think? Who has a business in here? You spoke earlier. Tell me about your business. I don't know if you're an owner of the business, but what do you think? Is IT just kind of a nuisance? Is there a cost center? Or does it really bring strategic value to, to the company? I mean, you guys are in doing electrical work. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that helps you sell better or do your job better that's IT related? Or is it more just kind of a cost that the company has to bear? I just want to say cost. Okay. There's, there's always there's strategy behind what we're doing with it, but it's mostly the concept. 
it's mostly cost. And you know, I didn't think a lot of people are in that mode. And I don't know, we may talk about this later, but the, the idea is how do you move from cost center to more efficient cost center, how to make my printing costs go down, to a business enabler, something that makes my business go better. We're gonna give you some examples of this so you can start thinking about it. And the fourth one is a strategic asset. How do we move to those uh, level of capabilities? We also are in a period of rapid change. And I'm going to convince you of that, but what you thought was changing in technology over the last 15 years, sorry, those were baby steps. You're about to go through a period of such rapid change. Many of you are seeing it already, and we'll point some of those things out to you, but uh, how you can take advantage of this. So let's talk a little bit about Amazon. Amazon's a company, what's their primary business? Cloud services. Oh man, you're good. Eat turkey though, I got it. Most people would say retail, right? They, I buy products from them, but you know what? Their biggest business is now their cloud hosting business. What? That's where they actually make money. What happened, what happened there? Anybody use Uber? Yeah, I see smiles, right? You're doing that. Why, why do you use Uber versus call a taxi? Cheaper, cleaner, convenience. Convenience. Okay. Should the taxi company have automated calling a taxi on their phone? Maybe. I don't want to call a dispatch. It'll be 45 minutes. I go to Uber and it tells me, hey, 10 minutes will be here. Right? So that, that's convenient. That's nice. Uh, this is kind of where the world's headed. We talked about those cameras earlier and they were pulling back pictures, right? And you're using an IP network. You can use a wireless network for that as well. And you can pull back all kinds of images and information. Uh, we have sensors all over the place. And ultimately, um, a little too far away. Anyway, we know that uh, we know that with the latest buzz, uh, we hear about the Internet of Things. Internet of Things, what's that? Somebody else said the Internet will disappear. Why will the Internet disappear? What does that mean? We take a cut out. What turnkey guy? Why is the Internet going to disappear? It's, Why? It's, it's just going to be seamless. Like, it's going to be. I, I mean, I've never heard it to disappear, it's just be seamless. It's seamless. You won't think about it. Yeah. Just like right now, I don't think about the power in this building comes from Amber. It's here, I don't even think about it. I'm always connected, maybe you're always connected data on your phone, right? I have my email, do I think about how it's getting there? No. Do I think about, I must be paying $10 a month for that. I'm paying something for it, but I don't think about it anymore. Similar with the internet, I don't even think about it anymore. And the fact that everything's going to be connected, don't doubt it. It will. Anything that, that, that's useful to be connected will be connected. Mm. Privacy? Mm. One of the things that I should consider with that, why is that important? And now we see self-driving cars, right? And you hear Google has a fleet of these. They've only had 10 accidents. And none of them were the technology's fault. Really, they say that. It's online, you can read it. What was the fault? The fault was, well, somebody switched to a manual mode, right? But wait for the first time the two automated cars collide because it falls. I'm going to get those Google guys. That's, they're going to pay, right? No, uh, ultimately, what, why is this important technology to us? Because we're lazy and don't want to drive. I like driving. What about you? No, 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 why is it important? You ever get frustrated on the road? So my my, my uh, son said this to me when he was 12 years old. Dad, everybody's going along at a good pace and we slowed down on the highway. Why do we slow down the highway? One person driving too slow. Or one person switching lanes when they should. And you think about that, you can gain, if with the internet of things, you might be able to control the traffic flow, and not just get frustrated more in traffic by getting stuck in some traffic jam all cause because someone got on the highway going 25. Something to think about. So six ways IT becomes strategic. I'm gonna start off by telling you this was written in 1974 by John Beeble. And I, you can read, read those over, but tell me if anything has changed. Oh, the game's changed. Services enhanced with technology. So back then, I know there's a lot of young people in the room. Let me tell you how it was back then when we had to walk both ways to school uphill. And the snow, it was so small. By the way, the snow was deeper then, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure it was. Of course, I was only that tall. I'm sorry, i got to tell a story. I, my father passed away a few years ago, and I always liked to play golf, and I'd never beat the man. Never beat him. 
but I was beaten and it's like literally this is this is absolute truth. God's honest truth. Three days before the guy's guy passed away, my dad passed away at an aneurysm. But we were playing golf. And I like this story because it's an old joke, but it's true. Uh, we're playing on this course, and it's a dogleg hole, and I have a one-stroke lead. And he said to me, like to take me on, he was kind of that way, he said, you know, when I was your age, I would hit it over that tree. So what did I do? I tried to hit it over the tree, and pop, that bounced back. Here I am, there's a wasted stroke. And he's catching up already. And I said, he said, why'd you do that? And I said, well, you said when you were my age, you hit that tree. And he said, well, when I was your age, that tree was that tall. <laughs> now, the reason that's important is thinking about how things change, right? And my, uh, there are a lot of people who were exposed to my father that, that I work with that met him, and he was kind of that guy with that sage wisdom that threw out little tidbits like that. At the time of playing golf, I thought he was just trying to get me to, uh, uh, he was just trying to egg me on and, and get my head and, so he could beat me. But we all have to change our thinking a little bit. We've got to think about how the world is changing so we can adapt. And the world's going to be changing rapidly. You see, we see uh, phones like this. Are these green, by the way? Let's think about that for a second. Is this a green device? No. No? Why? Well, I mean, it's uh, disposable. People yeah, change them. Just, it gives off a lot of CO2 emissions, and there are. Okay. Um, okay, so let's flip that around. 20 years ago, what did I have to do to go get in contact with work? I had to go drive to work. Two in the morning, I somebody called me and said, I got a problem with the system. I was in a car driving to work. Go help. Do I have to do that now? No, I can connect everything right here. I can connect to any app I want. I can connect to any system I want securely, and I can make connections without having to drive across town. I don't know which is more, more, uh, more effective, but. Let's go into these a little bit. So let's talk about services enhanced with technology. Um, I went to my physician two weeks ago for my annual physical. And I will tell you, my physician is my age, and I do remember when he had a clipboard and a white piece of, or a piece of paper on there, and he was taking notes. Does he do that now? Nope, he has an Apple iPad in his office, and he's recording information. And uh, many of those have come online. I like the fact that I got my lab results online. I could go sign in online and show the lab results and see that my cholesterol got a little bit better. That's good and those kind of things. But also know, you know, they give you the ranges and you go read up what kind of test is that, what's that mean. Those kind of things are all useful and they provide value to us in terms of managing our own health. This is where technology can bring value not just to the physician and be more efficient because you don't have to meet with me and go over the results but also give me more information to manage my life better. So an example of uh, enhancing technology with, with uh, cloud. We mentioned Uber, taxi manager. By the way, I met with this guy a couple weeks ago who said he was gonna make Uber for charter flights and we all could fly charter and pay the same amount as flying commercial. And the flight would take off whenever you get there and you wouldn't have to go through TSA. I said, I'm hooked, and if you can really pull this off, that's really cool, but it's an example of someone trying to think about this in a different way. And we know that phones and tablets are an enabler. They're very mobile. Uh, there are different people with laptops in here, but has anybody worked a whole day on their tablet? I, I have, you have, but why don't you do it? Do you do it every day? No. How come? Typing's too hard and too slow. Typing's too hard and too slow, maybe input's a little bit awkward. I challenged myself for a whole week to use a tablet, and you know what? I, I was able to do it. By the end of the week, I got more efficient. I'm just going to say that to you. You can test it out. The world is changing. It's morphing. There are opportunities to do those things. Secondly, cost displacement. I mentioned the business case. This is an example of hosted email for a 50-user company. So this company has 50 users, and this is moving to our hosted email. Now, why would you use our hosted email versus Office 365? Our is my MC. Why would you do that? Anybody, anybody have a reason you do that? Do you feel comfortable with cloud-based solutions? Do you feel comfortable with something being in a large cloud versus a small cloud? We, we find people come to us. In fact, recently a county in Pennsylvania signed up with our hosted email and said, why don't you do that versus Office 365? And their reply was, well, I want to know where my data is at. Okay. I get it. 
Some people feel that way. Missouri is the show me state. I thought I'd get a few more comments. But uh, uh, having grown up in Missouri, I, we all know that's a prevalent attitude. It's mainly central Missouri, though, right? It's not here. It's not the west or east side. You know, like that, right? But uh, this particular company is going to save uh, $20,000 over three years doing this. Um, another advantage uh, to solutions, I did that in the morning. Is uh, we have another thing happen. Anybody hear about big data? Anybody know what big data is about? Three years ago, I, maybe it was four years ago now, I was at a, an event and I got to hear the CIO of the CIA. That's a lot of letters. And this all came in the news when a couple years ago they can listen on every phone call and categorize it, listen for rogue actions, right? Why were they able to do that? Because technology's gotten so fast that we can analyze data. And it is enormous the amount of data that's out there around phone calls and text messages. We can now analyze it all. Really? Wow. That's amazing. Well, what's that mean to you? So Microsoft offers Power BI hosted on Azure, or we offer it as well on our hosted environment with SQL 2014 and Power BI tools. What are those, what does that mean? Well, in that, that realm, you pay $18 a month and you're able to get access to massive sources of data. There's another company I'm aware of called Bean, B-I-N-E, where you can go on Bean and you sign up for, like it's $15 plus uh, if you have one person who's a data analyst. And they have all these sources of data you can pull together and they can analyze. Why is that important? Anybody tell me? Business. To everyone's business in here. Business intelligence. Business intelligence is important, why? If you're turning data into information and making it useful. Okay, to you personally, let's take uh, your business. How do you identify possible candidates for your business? They come in your door, call you on the phone? They call, they either make a profile on our website or they come in. Okay, how could you reach them more effectively? I use social media. Use social media. Okay, social media is step one. What, how could big data help you? I want you to think about it. There's data sources all over the, let's say you have uh, access to the, the database showing that uh, um, Who's filed for unemployment? I will use that as an example. That that information is public, and you're able to pull it back. If it is public, and you can do those things, you gain access to that information. You also gain access to data that's captured on what someone is surfing. So I don't know who are the uh, major bandwidth providers in St. Louis that might be bringing in gigabit to the home. Anybody doing that? Level three doing that to the home? Not to the home. Not to the home. I know your backbone provider. So. Kansas City, Kansas uh, was the first place that Google came in. And Google brought fiber gigabits to the home. I have gigabits to my house. Uh, and they also bring cable TV. Why did they do that? Google? Why would they do that? Why are they doing that? You all know. They, they, know, know, everything. About. they know everything. <laughs> they know everything. Right. Now they're going to know everything you watch and everything you surf, every movie you stream, and then they can take that data and sell it back to a big data database. Because you'll buy it to know, wow, that guy at his home was looking for jobs on a job site. I'm going to call him and make him my customer. Maybe that's a good idea. They have their own analytics covering it. Everybody uses Google for, yeah. for everything. And you can get certificates for Google AdWords. And you can get a certificate to use their Google Analytics. And everybody uses it. So they've got, they've got very, it already. very good corner. they got it. Everything. They've got it already. Bing will tell you, Microsoft Bing will tell you, they got a lot of that too. It might, it might be a little cheaper, I don't know. Sir? Yes? I mean, to think back to the comment I made the earlier today, knowing which way the person turns when you go to the building. You get that data. That's right. Get that data, and if the data sources are produced in a big data database, that data may already exist. You may already be able to get that data, whether it's on Google or from other sources. These type of sources, you start looking at them, the light bulb will go on, the type of sources they'll bring to bear. Let me give an example of one thing, and that is, uh, there's a, a, a friend of mine, or an acquaintance I've made along the way, who runs a small pharmacy. Who's he competing against? Walmart? We'll just pick on them. Costco, whoever. The large pharmacies. How does he price his product? He says, I could be competitive, but nobody will come in and use me. He has to get a database of information that tells him the pricing of those products. Where does he get that data? 
where can you get that data? Where can you get what Walmart charges for some drug? Anybody know? You. From me, not necessarily from me, I, I didn't pull it together, but okay. someone else did. Uh, the answer is you got it from the insurance companies. They're paying the bill. They told them what they were charging. He got the data and then he was able to price his product more competitively. The insurance company liked it because users who go to him, they're not paying him a, a different rate than they pay Walmart. So he's still able to make his margin and he's able to be competitive and not lose his client base. Good for him. Go, go, rah, rah, Main Street. Let's talk about revising the mission. Netflix. Remember what Netflix used to do? They used to mail you DVDs. I see smiles. We all did it. It was kind of nice, but man, I never remember mail anything back until, why is this still here? And then I would do it. And then I had to go to the mailbox and I didn't like that. I'm lazy. Remember people used to drive to Blockbuster and rent a video? We drove to Blockbuster to rent a video to watch it for one night, then I had to remember to return it, so I didn't pay the late fee. Why would I do that? And now we're streaming. Is that more convenient? Yes, it is. What else could we do around that? TripAdvisor, anybody go on trips anymore and not look at TripAdvisor or some other service? Yelp. Yesterday we were driving through Columbia and Ken brought up Yelp and he found some restaurant that we would have never ever gone to and I really enjoyed it. It's called G and D or D and G or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, it's good. Good play, good good food. I recommend it. But we would have never looked. Uh, we would have never gone there if we hadn't looked. Uh, Kindle, anybody read paper books anymore? So talking about not printing paper. Yeah, I still read books. I don't like reading books on the computer. There you go. Your eyes are on the computer all day long, you get brain. That. You know where I read my books? It's on my iPhone. Can you believe that? But Teresa would print it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you know, there are different schools of thought. This is more convenient, right? I, I, can, I can read this almost anywhere, and I can get a new book almost anywhere, anytime I need it. I'm, uh, I've got a few minutes, I'm going to stop and read it. No, but don't you feel smarter walking into your house, into your library, you got four or five hundred books, your guests come over, oh, I feel the book, you feel smarter, right? Yeah, and then you get me a thousand books, but don't want to <laughs> Don't care? Actually, you know what, I have the, yeah, you're right, you're, you don't care. My house, I've got way too many books, you're right, from uh, being a, a reader from before. How many people listen to streaming music more than they listen to radio? There are, I, yeah, there are a lot of hands go up, and that's true. Um, it's an interesting switch. Okay, the other thing is business and relationships. So why would someone pick a cloud like MyApps Anywhere over other cloud providers? One of the things we've done is we've integrated these solutions. Now, tying into our theme today, I'll point out, we haven't used this screen enough, you guys are left in here. Paper save, hey, it's uh, paperless uh, technology for workflow. But we've integrated the entire suite of Microsoft products and deliver a holistic, uh, holistic solution under one banner. Why is that more efficient? Well, it's more efficient because you don't have to spend time doing all the integration. You have to do some integration. You may do something a little bit different. We met with a customer yesterday who had kind of weird business processes and they customized a lot of things. Uh, that can lead to more problems if you go do upgrades. By the way, we can switch the software to the business process. It should be the business process, not the software. So, uh, we've brought together a number of solutions, all designed to bring optimize your experience in your business. Okay, creating new products and services. If you end up use Apple Pay or uh, we had a customer called Softcard recently bought by Google. Why did they buy them? They bought them because nobody was taking their product and putting it on the Android phones. So they bought this company. Uh, but Softcard had a very cool system. Uh, for those of you who haven't used these, so let me tell you something Softcard did that I just thought was kind of cool. But it's, I'm bringing it up because it's innovative. It's a way to think about things differently. When they distributed, uh, they allowed you to distribute allowance to your kids. Did they do that still? Okay. You don't get one, that's a good idea. <laughs> well, just depending on something they should, right? And so I'm gonna talk about Yeah, that's right. Or you buy everything, well that happens too. Uh, but you know, if you give them 10 bucks or something and they distribute it out, they can go spend that on anything. Candy or, you know, something they shouldn't, some vice like cigarettes or something when they're uh, a teenager. What they did was they gave kids a plastic card, okay? They had a plastic card, and when they went to go spend it on something, it would go read what they were trying to buy, and in most cases, it would deny something that the parent did not want them to buy with that money. But it allowed you to automatically distribute it to the card, so to your kid, you don't want your kid buying cigarettes, they go try to buy cigarettes, it would deny the card. 
pretty cool stuff. That technology does exist. Uh, it is being embedded now in, uh, uh, into the Android product. But Apple Pay, I, I gotta tell you, I have it. I don't use it that much. Does anybody in here use it a lot? If not, why? There are a lot of places to use it, right? But the other thing is just thinking about it, getting used to it. Anybody played with 3D printers? That's pretty cool. Yeah, you've done some of that. What do you, what do you, is there something important? I know you guys are at the school, right? Is there something you're doing that's saving money for the school by doing that? Yeah, we're getting stages. Okay. I can think we'll get there. My middle daughter went to school at Trinity University in San Antonio. I just mentioned that because it doesn't matter where, but they have an engineering program. And in that engineering program, they, they discovered that if they print 3D products that they use to assemble their projects, it costs less than going to buy the products. Engineer. Very cool. I've seen people print statues, replacement parts for certain things. How about yourself? Use it for anything specific or? Yeah, I actually built a, a drone and used it to print three parts that were even if you couldn't make them, they were possible to make conventionally or more expensive. Yeah, and I understand you can do, uh, they're working on 3D printers to print copper. You can do a lot with that, electrical applications, etc. These are things in our life that are evolving over time. Uh, and I mentioned, we talked about Amazon Web Services, that's their number one business. Uh, by the way, who's the largest cloud provider in the world? Amazon. If you, much to, I'm sure Microsoft's your man, they're number two, but if you add the next 19 together, they don't add up to Amazon. That's how big they are. Who's their primary customer? Themselves. Who's the other one? Walmart. Okay. I get it. Uh, they're big right out of the gate for that. Uh, let's talk about execution. So we talked a little bit about the strategy. Now, how do we execute on the strategy? So this is really cool. Ex execution ch challenge number one is expertise. Where do you get expertise? You all are figuring out how to use 3D printers, right? Is there is somewhere else you could go to get that knowledge to help you do it? Maybe. How about yourself? Where do you work? New Horizons. New Horizons. Okay, you guys doing something where you need expertise? Tra trainers? Correct. Yeah. How do you get, go get those people? Where do you identify them? Are you doing employees or learn the material? Well, our instructors are typically the and we have a whole front line of people Look for people on clear. What about classes? Are all your classes in room? In classroom, are you doing some over the web? Mostly over the web. Mostly over the web. So let's talk about, there's a high school in North Dakota. North Dakota's a lot of dirt, right? If you live in North Dakota and you're in high school, you're gonna travel a long way to go to school. So one of the challenges with that is travel a long way to go to school, which is not great. Now, the other thing that's a challenge with that is, what, if you go to a high school that's with a small town, do you get the curriculum when you get to a large place? No. So how do you supplement that curriculum? That curriculum is supplemented by online. In this case, there's a high school in North Dakota that's entirely online. Your kid can attend an online high school and graduate. I don't know about their football team. I don't know if that's very, you know. It is interesting. Uh, by the way, we have another challenge. The challenge is everybody lives in a bad neighborhood. And we all like to not think about it. And I don't want to be the only new person out there, but every day we read about cyber attacks and the challenges. The Chinese government attack in the U.S. and stealing information. And we hear about major retailers who have information stolen. We get new credit cards in the mail and say, oh, this is because you know Target got reached and here's your new card. It happens, what's the personal impact to you? Well, maybe a little bit of uncertainty, but is it a big impact? Money all gets written off, right? So let's move on. Uh, it did cost uh, small to medium business $388 billion in 2013. So I'm gonna give you a, an example. Anybody in here hit by crypto? That's where encrypts your data and you have to pay a ransom. Anybody hit by that? I see heads nodding. There are lots of companies, don't, don't be shy. It happened to a lot of companies. There's a new variant out right now that, watch out, it's, it, it's a little bit worse. Uh, it actually was announced like yesterday that it's, that it's out there. 
What happens when you get crypto? Do you pay, did you pay the ransom? Anybody want to be brave and see what you did? Did you pay the ransom in Bitcoin and what did you do? We uh, restored from backup. Restored from backup. Yeah, and that's 95% of people restored from backup. I say that, but uh, here's the next challenge. 29% uh, of the US small businesses had a cyber attack in 2012. 72% are not able to fully restore from backup. It's a challenge. Why is that? My favorite thing to do is to go up to a, um, uh, like we go to banking conventions. I go to a bank convention that's a small bank, and I'll go up to them and I'll say, what's your job? And she'll say, head teller. And I say, Oh, what do you do? Do you do anything with IT? And she says, yeah, I, I rotate the tapes. And I say, okay, I do that. You take it home in your purse every night, right? Yeah. How often do you forget? To be honest, I do forget, she would tell me. Uh, it happens all the time. So those are all problems. That's great. Let's get to solutions. Your best position for success is to go with proactive experts. Why do I pay New Horizons for training? Because they're experts, right? I can, I can get the information I need. Uh, but you want people who are reacting before you need them to to solve the problem, and you want their expertise to solve the problem. That's our lowest to total cost of ownership. We need to manage risk differently. So with cloud providers, one of the things we have to recognize is that we're exposing ourselves in new ways. Before we thought about everything behind the firewall and all the antivirus I can put in place, those kind of products, if I put those in place, I'm secure, or I'm as secure as I possibly can. Now I have people that are traveling, as you said, never behind the firewall, doing their work every day. That company with 50 users that didn't have an office, what are they connected to? Who knows? File sharing services? Are people using Dropbox? Yes. Are people using OneDrive? Yes. Do you have any policy in your company around you're only to use this service? What's the risk with that? How do you restore from backup? Who's backing it up? Where's your data? You quit, get hit by a bus. How do I get your data? I've lost intellectual property. How can I let that happen? The control around the business is reduced. It's a challenge. We have to recognize what can we do around managing that. Well, you can do something. This is called a risk matrix. And what you do is identify the data that's important to you. Then you identify what the risk is. Have getting by a bus or you know, it's not backed up. And then you identify why, what your strategy is around protecting it. This doesn't really take that long. It really doesn't. And it's a good exercise to think through those details. But when you do that, you realize that your data is protected. Now, why would you use a cloud hoster? I might use them because I expect them to back data. Now, how am I going to verify they back their data? There's a document called an SSAE 16. That's an attestation from a third party that says they're doing what they say they're going to do. And if they list their controls, and one of the controls says they back up hourly or daily or whatever they back up, it'll list, yes, they do this, and I verify they do it. Now I say, ah, I'm talking about the auditor. So an SSA 16 becomes that mitigating control for you. Do not go with hosters that do not have SSA 16. They, they don't have any attestation of doing what they're saying. It also gives you that principle we said before, plan to check out. If you don't measure, you can't improve it. You can't improve it if you don't measure it. So what to look for in a cloud hosting provider? Does the hosting provider have uh, adequate controls? We just talked about. Will you own your own data? So why would I use uh, my apps anywhere versus Google apps? Does Google tell you you own your own data? Do you think that's their, in their best interest that you own your own data? Meaning I'm not going to look at it? What's their business? They want to look at your data, right? Does that bother you? I have found anybody in the age of 30 doesn't seem to care about whether their data gets viewed or not. That's an interesting thing. I'm, in, I'm interested if anybody's in that range. No, I care. I haven't heard anybody say that. I will tell you anybody over the age of 50 always cares, it seems like. But the, the bottom line is, and the people in the middle kind of are in different spots. But the bottom line is, will you own your data? That's important for you to ask the question, do I care? And if you do care, Make sure you have taken due care and verify they have control. What are the associated costs? Is it going to be close? Do you have control in the agreement that allows you to, uh, uh, you know, exert some influence over the client if there's a pro over the hosting provider if there's a problem? And what kind of support can I get? Uh, 
Our support's seven by 24, but we're one of the top 200 cloud hosters in the world. So there are a lot of other people. There are 10,000 hosters in the United States. Of those 10,000, what kind of support are they providing? It's easy to understand. If you can understand that, you can, uh, um, you can go from there. The last thing is to understand if you're using cloud, what are your organization's responsibilities? What is it you're responsible for? As an example, maybe they're still requiring you to back up the data. Maybe. Uh, I will tell you one thing. There's that last point. I do want to talk about that for a second. This is me on the soapbox. Who's responsible for disaster recovery in your organization? Is it the cloud hoster or is it you? The answer is it you. And does the cloud hoster have a DR plan? Say they do. Yeah, they do. My app's anywhere has a DR plan. Does that DR plan meet your business requirements? I'm going to say maybe not. You still need to evaluate those things. It's still on you. I'm not saying that we wouldn't meet your business requirements. We probably would. But you need to think about it. You still own it. It's still your responsibility to think about managing risk in your environment. That's just me. A lot of people get bored by that. But the fact is, you, you still own it. You still need to think about it. So we offer SSA 16. Uh, we work with a lot of compliant uh, organizations, HIPAA, high tech. Uh, it's certainly a component of that. We work with banks, which is FFIC guidelines, um, and we work with uh, wealth management firms, SEC 17A4, and all those all those rule sets. But the idea of PCI, uh, the idea is to be able to deliver a compliant experience. If you're using just a generic cloud-based application, you can't really do that. You have to think holistically about the solution. So PCI, payment card industry standards, you need to design a solution that addresses all those risk matrices. And um, you also have to think about the highest level of security protection. Our, our cloud has 23 levels of security controls. The average company has seven. That's an example. Understand that. Understand there's actually an advantage to being in the cloud versus uh, on-premise. Many people don't think that. They think, I'll be, better, I'll be a better steward of my data than they will. That's not necessarily true. That may be the hosting provider's job. I think it is. That hedgehog principle, that's where they focus their energy and time. You can tell I care a lot about risk, and I'm going to manage risk. You may not care about risk at all. Would you rather have me managing your risk or helping with you do that? Um, you want to make sure they have an availability record that's strong and reliability. You want to make sure their underlying infrastructure is strong. Do they have redundant power and cooling in their, as their base infrastructure? Are they monitoring the video? Are they making sure that they are protecting their facilities? You have to have those things in place in order to be effective. So we were, uh, My Apps Anywhere was launched in 2006. We promised 99.999% uptime. Uh, our solutions are holistic. They can help your business. So I'm going to stop right there. I don't like reading slides. But we do have 24 by 7 by 365 support. And I'm going to say this. Uh, let's start a business. You want to start a business? Let's make a, let's make a food product. Let's, uh, what's your favorite food? Veggie burgers. Veggie burgers. Okay, so I'm going to put some veggies in a burger with me. And uh, we're going to freeze them. We're going to freeze them and ship them to Walmart. Okay, that's what we're going to do. What's it going to cost us to launch an application that allows us to do that? So we're going to we're going to manage collecting all the raw materials. We're going to manage our manufacturing machines. Now we got to buy machines. I don't know what those are going to cost you. But let's talk about just the software to run that. Take a stab. What's going to cost me every month? Monthly. Yeah. How big are we? Does it, does it matter how big you are? Today it's just us. Just us. We're starting. And, and when we have 500 employees, it's going to cost the same amount. Um, okay. I don't know. We're going to manage the shipping. And we're going to manage, we're going to do what's called field to fork. We're going to manage all the way from our source so we can say where we got our meat and our veggies. We're going to manage that. We can tell the FDA that. We're going to manage it all the way to the store, out to consumer. If I told you that was $987 a month, would you be more excited about making veggie burgers? Without the meat, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking burgers with veggies in them. I'm a meat eater. I'm like, oh, I'm a we can I'm carnivore. Wait a minute. No, we can, you, you make yours, I'll make mine. Okay. I'm from Kansas City. We don't eat, we don't eat veggies. None of that. Gotta have meat. If you know what meat, that count. Uh, anyway, all that said, I don't know. You know, you're not speaking from a good English. But uh, 
But $987 a month, we can start a company. That's our investment in the software to run the business. That's accounting, that's payroll, that's everything I need. That's using Dynamics ERP, uh, vicinity manufacturing, and Applist to manage our warehouse and our distribution. Those three packages combine $987 a month. Doesn't matter how many accounts I have or how many employees. Is that powerful to you, an enabler for you, as you think about launching a different business? Yes, are you ready to start? You said sure. I heard you, we're gonna, we're gonna run this business. We'll figure that out. Anyway, all good, we're gonna run from home, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need stick in office. We're remote. Questions for me, I kind of covered a lot of ground. I try to make it you know, certainly interesting. Yes, sir? But what's the power by net standard? Net standard's the name of our company. MyApps Anywhere is a brand uh, that resellers wow. use nationwide. So we have a network of 275, 275 resellers. We have customers all 50 states, U.S. Virgin Islands running this. So um, literally we're doing a maintenance and people have to think about the fact that we have customers in Hawaii, which that's also interesting because it wasn't too long ago that the, net, the internet was not fast enough to allow anybody to run an application in Hawaii. In fact, when these guys said they were interested, I, the first one, I said, Let's try it out before we go do it, because I, I don't want you to be unhappy. We do charge month to month, by the way, and customers come on board and they pay their $987 for a month and they don't like it, they walk away. But the point is, we have customers who can use it nationwide now because the internet is faster. Something called latency has dropped. So good question, good one. Other, other questions? Uh, Michael Hollingsworth is the man in St. Louis who uh, brings us over regularly to talk to different people, and I know that we, we've we talked. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been other, other people I know uh, that we've met with uh, over the last few months, uh, certainly. And Michael has, uh, has the ability to consult, bring great value to everyone. I'm embarrassing him, he's turning red in the face. I don't know why he do that. He's, very, he's a very useful guy if you haven't met him before. <laughs> I spent time, he's been up here talking to us, but uh, uh, very useful, uh, con consultative person to, to help folks out. So. If you ever have any needs, reach out to him. He helps a lot. Our team here, real quick, uh, Teresa Keenan is our uh, channel manager. She provides all the pricing. Ken Augustine actually runs uh, the My Apps Anywhere organization uh, and uh, does that regularly. Um, my job is to stand up talk, talk in front of people, be a bigger head or something. Anything else I can, uh, anything else you can come to mind? If not, Thank you so much for your time, and, and I appreciate the opportunity, and we'll look forward to talking to you all one-on-one if you have any things that come up.